Stay tuned to PBS 39 as we go full steam ahead on Focus and explore the world of education through science, technology, engineering, art, and math. We take you inside the creative classroom of a local physics teacher with flair, spend an hour writing computer code with elementary school students, and explore a new outlet for entrepreneurial college students. Plus, we meet an artist and instructor who combines geometry, symmetry, and creativity and give our times tables a test with a math game created by a Bethlehem family. Stay with us and pick up steam on Focus. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest, Banking Insurance Investments, Fellowship Community, Continuing Care with Spirit, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for Focus. I'm Laura McHugh, coming to you from the PPL Public Media Center at PBS 39 in Bethlehem. For the next few weeks, we're going full steam ahead on Focus to see how local educators innovate in the areas of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. We start with a focus on science and a Parkland High School physics teacher who brings a special degree of enthusiasm to his classroom and his students. Remember, the law of freely falling bodies. The feather. <laughs> if you could walk into That's Albert Einstein's right. mind, you might get an idea what it's like to walk into Jeffrey Weatherhold's classroom. This apparatus here I designed uh, about 20 years ago. Mr. Weatherhold is a very unique individual. He is someone who lives, breathes, and sleeps science. Parkland High School's Jeffrey Weatherhold has spent the last 30 years creating a fertile environment for teaching physics. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like if a tree fell in a forest. Mr. Weatherhold's class is certainly uh, an interesting one, uh, extremely unique. He has like roller coasters, he has, um, you know, vacuums, and he has everything. Everything to make physics fun. <laughs> so I started collecting toys at flea markets and toy stores. So I figured, you know what, I'm a toy collector, I'm going to start bringing in some of my toys. When I was freshman and sophomore, I always passed by his room and I just like saw his room is crazy, like packed with uh, fun stuff. So if I hit the tennis ball like that... And he began like, teaching in 1985 and has been bringing in his gadgets and gizmos ever since. I would say almost everything in there has a role in the classroom. Because where some people might simply see a toy... One, two, three. Okay. Did you hear the first hit? Mr. Weatherhold sees a physics lesson. If you look at the ceiling of my classroom, I have lots of gizmos, many of them made out of connects. In this case, Mr. Weatherhold has rigged up a contraption to keep his TV remote handy while demonstrating Newton's laws. We have rotation. We have equilibrium. So when I'm not pulling it, it stays put because there's a counterweight. When I put it back, you get rotation of the toy airplanes. For this AP physics class, Mr. Weatherhold presents his version of a popular physics exercise called Shoot the Creature, which demonstrates projectile motion. It kind of shows like no matter what velocity you launch the ball at, you always end up hitting the creature. Bullseye. Right. Mr. Weatherhold, an amateur artist who makes his own science-themed ties, goes one step further by showing one of his original animated videos 
to explain how he captured the creature. Let's talk about the physics. Without gravity, I would just have to aim directly at the creature to hit it. Bullet and creature fall together. Mr. Oh my, the creature's loose. Everyone get out of here. Oh no, oh no. Whoa, whoa. Mr. Weatherhold also takes old gadgets and combines them with new ones, as he did with his 21st century toy chimp and an old wind-up telephone. So rather than having the monkey run on batteries, you turn the crank of this early 20th century generator to operate this monkey. So I have energy that I got from the sun, and then that energy I can put into the chimp by turning the crank. A couple croquet balls and a hanger serve as an excellent prop for demonstrating Newton's first and second laws of motion. You know, as I'm walking, I might see a neighbor. Oh, hi, Elizabeth. How are you doing? I just drilled a hole in each croquet ball and took a hanger and bent it. And so I've been using that for years. He picked that up from two physicists during a meeting held by the American Association of Physics Teachers. So that's what's really cool about physics is the way everything kind of ties together. He really is passionate about what he does and it's just about expanding the knowledge of science in every which way he can. If you see the study of physics as a set of boring laws created by eccentrics to befuddle the rest of us, you need to find a physics teacher like Mr. Weatherhold. His sense of humor is always there. It's uh, dynamic. It connects the teacher and the students together. And that's the great thing about this class. OK. All right, so here we go. And it's that magnetic attraction that puts Mr. Weatherhold in a class of his own. For Focus, I'm Grover Zilcox reporting. Right. Thank you, Grover. As we turn our focus from science to technology, we remain in the Parkland School District, where in December, students participated in a global computer programming initiative called the Hour of Code. Almost 200,000 Hour of Code events have taken place in more than 180 countries, reaching an estimated 210 million people. It's a global movement to promote the 21st century skills of problem-solving logic and creativity. In our region, dozens of schools participated. At this after-school activity at Fogelsville Elementary School, you can find hardwired produce, and maze running robots, along with dozens of kids practicing computer programming as part of Code.org's International Hour of Code. Hour of Code is a worldwide event. We decided that it was something that we wanted to bring into our school. We see the value of giving the children opportunities to explore coding, and it's really a 21st century learning skill that we want them to have to be able to go out into the workforce after they leave us. All right, let's see. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll go step by step. Organized by media specialist Samantha Edwards, Fogelsville alone saw more than 600 students participate in one week, many of them as young as five years old. Kindergartners can code? Well, yeah, they can. All grades were represented, and what was really neat is you can just see the excitement in their face that they were able to figure it out. A decade ago, who would have thought that kids as young as five are doing computer science, even at its smallest level? And so when we take a look at days like today with Hour of Code, we see kids problem solving, kids coding, and kids creating. And that really gets to higher order thinking, and that's truly what school should be about, creating kids that problem solve, that can create, can synthesize, can analyze, because that's what our world needs. In every nook of the media center, students tested their technology skills. And the best part about it is the Code.org program created it to make it kid friendly, and the kids really bought into it. I'm Bryson, and I'm in second grade in Fogelsville Elementary School. I've been playing uh, Star Wars and Frozen and Minecraft, and I was coding and trying to get my way through the levels. Learning about technology is cool and it's also like really fun to do when your friends are with you too. I'm the state and district digital learning director for the nation through the Alliance for Excellent Education and we run Future Ready Schools. More important than my job, I'm here as dad. And so it's great to be here in a school district to see them offering opportunities like this for all children. All children, K-5, to have an opportunity to hop on a device and to learn to code and to learn to problem solve. 
about technology is fun and challenging because there's some hard parts and some easy parts, and you also have to work as a team. Congratulations, boys and girls. You made it through one hour of coding. But Mrs. Edwards and her students didn't stop after one hour. In our media center, we've created a separate section, and in this section, we have a makerspace. And we're really proud of all the STEAM-related activities that we have. As part of a pilot program for Parkland School District, students can choose from a dozen stations and a variety of creative technology tools. Here we have Rosella and she's actually playing the piano on Brussels sprouts. While some students make music, others can create virtual stories using computer programs and even green screens. Score! While others, like Jason, can practice mechanics, robotics, and more. Left turn. <laughs> His name's Mekanoi, and he can do a lot of things like move forward and dance. A few months ago, many of the students had little to no programming experience. Yet they recently placed in the top 10 in a national robotics competition, showcasing just how much they can learn in a short period of time. We're going to try to make the Ollie, go through here and knock down the yellow brick wall. It took about five minutes and several adjustments, but on the tenth try... Timber! There's always that moment when it works perfectly and you're just in awe of how, how crazy it is. And that's exactly the reaction educators here hope for as they encourage and equip the next generation of innovators. In our next story, we focus on technology as well as entrepreneurship. Business innovators in the Lehigh Valley have a new resource in Penn State University. To tell us more, here's Focus reporter Grover Silcox. Thanks, Laura. Penn State Lehigh Valley is one of six Penn State campuses given sponsorship of the university's LaunchBox, a university and community-supported business accelerator program. We met the entrepreneurs behind two startup businesses in the LaunchBox, one involving health sciences, the other in computer technology and programming. Here's how Penn State Lehigh Valley LaunchBox hopes to help them lift off and soar. Lehigh Valley entrepreneurs with good ideas for new companies now have a way to start up and take off. You know what, I jump on the website because there's this company and just do a search and you'll find the opportunity. With a boost from Penn State Lehigh Valley's LaunchBox, a new business accelerator program. The fuel for what they do is encouragement. Some, just somebody there that they can come to and I can encourage them to keep going and point them into some directions. Mike Kreisa, a faculty liaison for Penn State Lehigh Valley's LaunchBox, provides guidance for the 13 different startups and the entrepreneurs behind them. Uh, what do you think about this opportunity? Right now we're incubating. We're starting them up. We're giving them the resources and, and things to help them grow. Resources such as free office and meeting space, internet and phone at Velocity, the downtown Allentown building renovated by developer J.B. Riley's City Center Lehigh Valley. The whole building now provides space for entrepreneurs to work and share ideas. We were generously provided the space to work in, the Velocity building, and we're also given some financial and legal um, access to legal services, and that's really helping us. Vinod Juratnam and Nabil Zagtiti met at Penn State Lehigh Valley as students and later graduated at the main campus. Penn State Lehigh Valley accepted them in the LaunchBox program based on their plan for a medical scribe service. A medical scribe is an individual who does the electronic, a patient's electronic chart in real time with a physician. This allows a physician to focus 100% on the patient. Vinod and Nabil plan to train and place medical scribes in hospitals, outpatient care facilities, and private practices, hopefully throughout the Lehigh Valley and beyond. They have developed a website, marketing strategy, and training methods for the candidates they plan to hire. We've already connected them with a former member of the Penn State Lehigh Valley's advisory board who happens to work for one of the largest health networks here. So that's exciting for them. Penn State's Lehigh Valley LaunchBox also awards micro-grants, ranging from $1,000 to $8,000. 
But the greatest support comes from Penn State's vast resources. We were looking for ideas that came with a strong team. We were looking for opportunities and individuals who could in fact benefit from the complement of services that we would provide. That would include mentoring as well as uh, professional development opportunities. Steve Borner and David Gritz, two graduates of Lehigh University, also joined LaunchBox. They're developing the Virtual Incubator Network, which Penn State Lehigh Valley hopes to apply to the LaunchBox program itself. The entrepreneurs are already principals in Hatch House, a Bethlehem-based incubator. The Virtual Incubator Network, however, differs in that it's not tethered to one location. It will be global via the internet. Steve and David are still in the very early development stage. And what we wanted to do was create a product that takes all the benefits of our physical incubators uh, and takes that to the virtual world. Really emphasize the LinkedIn part of this. Now people from all over the world who are part of maybe the LaunchBox community uh, or you know, global network of online campuses can find different people and share in resources all over the world. A university by definition serves as a center of knowledge. Now with programs like Penn State's LaunchBox, they're also becoming global incubators for innovation. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thank you, Grover. Next, we focus on arts with an artist and instructor whose work combines geometry, symmetry, color, and creativity. For more, here's Focus reporter Brittany Garzillo. Thanks, Laura. Stephanie Smith is a resident artist at the Banana Factory Art Center in South Bethlehem. Stephanie's pieces include bright colors and geometric shapes, and for her, provide something more. Take a look. In her studio at the Banana Factory in South Bethlehem, resident artist Stephanie Smith puts pastel-colored artist crayons to paper. I am working with some artist crayons, some very bright colors over black paper to make a mandala. Stephanie starts her drawing from the center of the page and works her way outward, turning it as she goes. It, it holds the energy of the moment that it's being created in. In this moment, Stephanie freehands her latest piece of mandala art. Mandala is a sacred form of circular art that typically starts at the center and radiates outward in repeating patterns. They're primarily symmetrical in nature. For Stephanie, this ancient art allows for both self-expression and spirituality. I believe that doing anything that allows you to shut the mind off and bring clarity and a presence and, and a focus uh, I think can, can definitely help as for personal growth and spiritual development. Stephanie, a self-taught artist from Bethlehem, says she's grown both personally and spiritually since she was first introduced to mandalas, also pronounced as mandalas, in 2007. The word mandala, it's a Sanskrit word, an ancient, uh, an ancient Hindu language that means whole. And so it's loose, like some people say whole, they mean circle. Today, she considers herself a visionary artist. Visionary, not as in forward thinking, but visionary as in um, allowing myself to create for a higher purpose. Drawing and painting for a higher purpose. Peace of mind. It's just, it's brought a certain level of peace to me that I've never had in my life. Stephanie's hand painted and drawn thousands of mandalas, some more personal sketches, I had little phrases of where I was in the moment, like this when anything was possible. And others that hang in the halls of the banana factory. And so then everything that I kind of learned during the eight months of creating this piece inspires the next. You know, each, each thing that you do as an artist, each piece inspires the next. Art is accessible to everyone. It's accessible to everyone to create as well as view. While some pieces may take only one sitting to complete, Others take months. You're making an energetic declaration to the, to the universe that I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do something that's going to have potential of further reaching benefits. Painting oftentimes without the end result in mind. I just sit down and, and allow whatever happens to happen. So it's very expressive at times. It's very therapeutic. It's very healing. Stephanie hopes her art will inspire creativity within others. 
I just want people to feel comfortable and non-judgmental about what they create. And that's why art can be accessible to everyone because they don't need another voice telling them that they can't do something or that they're not good enough. Spirituality to me, it's really about knowing yourself because by knowing yourself, you know more of what's bigger than you. A message that comes full circle in every piece she creates. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzilla reporting. Thank you, Brittany. To focus on math, Brittany Grover and I are now joined by a few special guests. Along with her mother and brother, Velvet Alvarez created a math game to help kids learn about multiplication. Velvet, we'll hear more from you in just a minute, but first we want to introduce some of our other friends who are here from Dunnigan Elementary School. Go ahead. My name is Stephanie. I am in fifth grade and I like math because there are many different ways you can work with numbers. All right, and joining Mr. Grover. Go ahead. My name is Jonah. I am in fifth grade and I like math because there are so many different problems and so many different ways to solve them. That's awesome, That's Jonah. Awesome. <clears throat> and how about you? My name is Malayshka. I'm in fifth grade and I like math because I feel smart when I'm doing it. It's because she wants to be a doctor when she oh. grows up. That'll be important. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a great team of people here who are actually going to help us play the math game. But first, we want to know, Velvet, how you and your family created this game. Sure. So um, I was young. I was probably in uh, eighth grade of middle school. And my mom came, came up with this idea. Uh, she told all the family. And she said, I, have, I made something cool. We were all pretty <laughs> kind of like, oh, what? What's this idea? Uh, none of us could have imagined that she would have invented a multiplication board game. <laughs> so she went ahead and she grabbed flashcards and she started drawing them out with a Sharpie. And um, none of us understood really what the game was about until my mom said, let's play. So we're all sitting in the din dining room table and we're playing a game that we've never played before on flashcards. <laughs> and um, we all were shocked with how amazing this was and how fun it was. So my dad said, why don't you patent it? So we went ahead and we started doing it and it's grown to be our family business now for five years and we have really enjoyed it. So yeah. what do kids learn through playing the game? Yeah, so there's many um, aspects to the game. So one of the main thing is um, they have fun doing it. So my mom really struggled during um, her years of school and she thought there's got to be an easier way to learn your multiplication tables. Mm -hmm. So she, um, she said, I'm going to make it fun. And that's the whole point of the game. It's really easy to play. It's really easy to understand. And um, she kind of wanted to have the family aspect, get everyone together and just enjoy and have a good time while they're uh, kids, students, um, learn the multiplication tables. So that's pretty much the basics of it. And there's so many ways to play it, so many ways to have fun with it. Well, show us the most basic way you can play. I see there's sure. three basic components. We have answer yes. cards, question cards, Correct. and an answer chart. Correct. So we have an answer chart. Um, and this here um, on the back, it has all the answers um, within the decks, 1 uh, times 1 to 10 times 10, um, so 1 to 100. And um, what is here, the kids usually, they look at this in case they don't know what an answer is to a card. Um, they say, oh, I'm not sure what uh, 5 times 6 is. They'll look it up and say, oh, okay, now I know. So they'll keep that in their mind and they'll, they'll repeat it during the game until they have that opportunity where that card comes out and they can put it down. Mm -hmm. So as they're playing, they, they're learning. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what the goal for this one is. This is also for the judge. So how we play it is there is one judge and, and there's two up to uh, 10 other players. So it can be in a small or a bigger group. Now, um, the judge has this in case um, it's a group of just kids playing. They can refer to this and say, oh, I don't know that one, but I'm going to look it up. Mm -hmm. So it, it helps them to uh, learn as they're playing as well. So let's do a practice round Yes. now before so, we start playing for real. Let's do it. Um, so what we're going to do, um, we have a timer. We're going to play with five seconds. So you Because have, these guys are so smart? Yes, okay. they are <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> so we have five and ten seconds. So we're going to play with five. The ten seconds is for students that are just learning it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down the question two times two, and I'm going to start the timer. Do if have you it? have the answer, you want to put it down as quickly as possible. Do your we have goal two times is two? to get rid of all of your cards. No, now I'm going to no. say time. Timer's up. I'm going to say no one has the answer. The answer is four and I'm going to move on. So that card is now over. We're going to move on to the next one. 10 times 5. Start the timer. Oh, we have it. We have a winner. So many players can have up to 
uh, up to four players can have the same card. So that's where competition comes into play. So you want to be quicker than your peers. You want to be quicker so you're competing against everyone. So we also developed a chart. I'm not sure if we, yeah, if show we can it. show, no, it. We can show okay. it. So we have a chart that we've developed, um, and it tells you how many uh, possibilities of each answer you can put down. Um, so for number one, like number one, there's right. one times one only one possibility. Uh, two has two times one, one times two. So there's two possible cards. So Grover and Laura can have that card and whoever puts it down first gets to, um, wins that round and then so forth. So there's up to four possibilities for number 10. There's four. Um, what we call the one circled in red are danger cards. Mm. They're danger cards because they only appear once. So okay. if you have it, there's benefits um, and other, other things. Some kids say, oh, what's best? I say, well, it depends on how you feel about it. If, you're, if you know that answer and you put it down, you're the only one during that round. You don't have to worry about someone else winning <laughs> for you. Um, so the goal ultimately is yes. to get rid of all the cards exactly. in your hand. And when you answer incorrectly, you take a, not only back your card, yes. but you also take two back more. two more. Which is the punishment. That's why we have some always okay. left over from the answer deck. Okay, okay. Well, we only have about a minute left. Can we play a hand real quick? Let's Can do we it. Play Let's a few times? Okay, okay. Ready, all right, are you ready? Okay. So we, we got this one. Yep. Let's take it yep. back just for okay. now. So Since that was just a practice round. Let's do another one. Five times ten. Oh, five times ten. Five times ten. Oh, we got it. Times. As oh. the judge, that was a really close one. I think <laughs> Brittany Yay, put it down. Wow. So wow. what was the answer, Steph? Fifty. Fifty. Fifty, 50. 50. 50. 50 yeah. as well. Got yes. it right here. All right. Let's do one or two more. Okay. Ten times six. <laughs> times sixty. Good. The answer is correct. Good. Wow. Five times six. 30, good job, Very time, good. that was great. Five times five? Do we have it? No, we don't have it. We got it. Good. So we have a deck. That was <laughs> a... <laughs> I have a good teammate. Yes, and that was a danger card, so only that team would have had that card. Oh, yes, 25, okay. so and 25 is one of the danger cards. And you see it written in English and Spanish. Yes, the game is bilingual, so um, families can learn their numbers if they don't know the other language, they can play in their they'll learn at least a few things in, in the other language. Um, we, our family, speak both English and Spanish, so we wanted to pass on that and have everyone play play with two, two languages. Velvet, thank you so much. You're We're going to keep playing, yes. but we'll see you next week as we continue our special coverage of STEAM education. Until then, remember to focus on what matters. Right, can we keep playing? Yes. Discover Lehigh Valley with the Northampton County Calendar of Events. Bach at Noon is February 9th at Central Moravian Church in Bethlehem. Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike runs through February 21st at Pennsylvania Playhouse in Bethlehem. Chocolate and Romance is February 13th and 14th in Easton. And the Church and Chapel Tour is February 13th at 2 p.m. at Moravian Museum of Bethlehem. On the next all-new episode of Focus, PBS 39 goes full steam ahead to explore science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Local schools have students as young as kindergarten working on computer programming as they participate in a national program called Hour of Code. Plus, Penn State Lehigh Valley gives student entrepreneurs